In Bacon's Rebellion, you have a wealthy planter, Nathaniel Bacon, who becomes the leader of around a thousand poor, disgruntled, former indentured servants who have a grudge against the governor. But Bacon dies, the rebellion is put down, and things go back to where they were. Or do they? Actually, they don't. You see, Bacon's Rebellion was one of the most important turning points in American history, in particular when it comes to race relations, because the conflict exposed the class tensions within society. Non-elites in Virginia were having trouble gaining upward mobility, and they resented elites in the colony, so much so that they were willing to rise in mass and incite rebellion. In fact, no slave uprising in American history ever matched the scale of Bacon's Rebellion. The elites, on the other hand, worried about these former indentured servants challenging their authority. The indentured servants, most of whom had allied with Bacon, were free men, but they couldn't rise in status because they couldn't get land, and therefore they couldn't vote. At this time, the line in society was drawn between the rich and the poor. But... The more the poor began to outnumber the rich, elites began to think that maybe the servanthood system wasn't such a good idea after all. So instead, elites began expanding freedom for poorer whites while directing poor white anger towards non-white enemies instead of the elites. They did so by embracing slavery, taking land from Native Americans, and then offering that land to relatively poor whites. So rather than draw the line between the rich and the poor, the elites redrew the line between white and non-white. Thus, Bacon's Rebellion was the political turning point for slavery in America. Between 1680 and 1700, slaves supplanted indentured servants in the Chesapeake. By the mid-1680s, just a decade after Bacon's Rebellion, Black slaves outnumbered white servants among the plantation colony's new arrivals for the very first time. By 1700, slaves were 10% of Virginia's population. Fifty years later, they were approximately half. Prior to this point, there wasn't a whole lot of difference between a slave and an indentured servant. A few of the earliest African immigrants actually gained their freedom and some even became slave owners themselves and indentured servants were often treated just as bad as their black co-workers. But with this new change, as indentured servants began to be replaced by slave labor, um, and recognizing the potential power of the growing black population, Virginia's House of Burgesses enacted a slave code in 1705, which embedded principles of white supremacy in the law. According to this code, slaves were property subject to the wills of their masters. They could be bought, sold, leased, and passed on to one's heirs. And the slave code affected all blacks, not just those who were enslaved. It said that no black person, free or slave, could own a gun, hit a white man, or employ a white person. There was also one very interesting clause that said no minister of the Church of England or other minister or person whatsoever within this colony and dominion shall hereafter wittingly presume to marry a white woman with a Negro or mulatto woman, or to marry a white woman with a Negro or mulatto man, upon pain of forfeiting and paying for every such marriage the sum of 10,000 pounds of tobacco. What we see here is a clear move to try to very distinctly divide the population between white and black. Any blurring of those races was seen as a threat to society. By this point, Virginia had changed from a society with slaves to a slave society. In other words, a society that could not exist without slavery, whose entire economic foundation was built upon the institution. This was a key turning point for the South. When we look at which colonies had slave codes, What we can see is that the higher percentage of slaves in a colony, the more racial tension there was, and the more slave codes were therefore put in place. And whenever there was more slave codes put in place, there were more rebellions. One of the most significant rebellions took place in 1739 in Stono County, South Carolina, about 20 miles from Charleston. Twenty blacks met near the Stono River and took guns and powder from a store, killing the two shopkeepers. They headed south towards St. Augustine, gathering more followers, burning houses, and killing whites. 
By the time slave owners caught up to them, the band of rebels numbered 60 to 100, and the deaths included 20 whites and 40 blacks. This was the largest slave uprising in the 13 colonies prior to the American Revolution, but it illustrates an even larger point. While increased slave codes led to rebellions, rebellions led to even more slave codes. Following the Stono County Rebellion, new laws were passed, which prohibited slaves from growing their own food, assembling in groups, earning money, or learning to read. The more slave codes, the higher risk of rebellion. And thus, a unique slave system was born in the South, based on race and heavy oppression. <laughs>